Welcome to Chapter by Chapter. I am your host, Brian Thomas Crop, and I believe that stories have a tremendous power for good, and so I write them, and I enjoy sharing those stories with you. If you are new to the podcast, then uh, you should know the way the show tends to roll is just in a moment. I'm going to read a chapter from a book that I have written, a story that I've written, and then on the other side of that chapter, go into a little more of some of the behind the scenes, how it got made stuff. So whether that's Easter eggs or memories or um, how a, a story gets written, or at least how I wrote a story, or maybe how I goofed something up, that might be in there too. Um, all that kind of behind the scenes, director commentary stuff uh, there is at the end. Um, we are in uh, a novel that I wrote, a crime detective story called The Shell Game. And where we are in the story, um, the, our detective, uh, Evan Gold, um, again, is in a heap of all kinds of difficulty. Uh, there's been some murders. His partner got murdered uh, a couple of days ago. If not last night, I'm kind of lost in the, the timeline right now. His marriage is going south. His business has troubles. He's got a client who initially hired him and his partner to find her lost father only to find out that she was lying and that's sort of how his partner gets killed and there's been some other murders and anyway there's a there's a whole thing and he has run across this uh, pearl that is um, has some kind of unusual qualities. It uh, g- kind of gives him visions. It heats up and cools down at random times, and there's just stuff going on with that. He has run into, very recently, uh, a man named Harold Huber, who doesn't know that Evan has this pearl, but wants to recover the pearl for his boss and is willing to hire Evan to find the pearl and return the pearl to what this guy, Harold Huber, says is the rightful owner. And um, Evan has Harold's number, essentially. Um, He thinks that Harold is a goofball and kind of a lunatic and um, um, is trying to keep an eye, I guess, on on Harold. But Harold has left the office and... um, uh, Evan is trying to figure out what to do with his evening uh, to help move this case along. So without too much further ado, we will get into Chapter 16 of Shell Game right after we hear from this week's sponsors. Chapter 16. It was a long half hour before Evan Gold left his office to go about his evening. The sun was down before Evan decided to leave his office. The air was thick and clung to everything. Evan looked up at a street light and noticed wisps of impossibly tiny droplets swirling in the light. The fog was gaining in strength. Evan blew out and watched the water droplets swirl around, bump into, and dance with each other. If he couldn't figure out the cause of the fog, if he couldn't reason its existence, if he had no power to make it lift, He could at least have some fun with it. He headed north up commercial and was about to make his way to cross fifth. He spied the hint of a woman seated on a bench two doors down from his office building. Her presence was not out of the ordinary if the sun was up. The town leaders had installed several benches along commercial for passers-by to sit a spell and enjoy the small town culture. However, it was dark. It was foggy. She didn't bother Evan's sensibilities enough to avoid her, but she certainly made her way onto his radar. The closer he got, the more her features became defined. Peroxide hairdo, feminine-styled wool trench coat, comfortable heels. There was something familiar that Evan couldn't quite identify. She looked like a low-rent Lauren Bacall, like someone straight out of a movie set in Paris or San Francisco. Her style was somewhat jarring in the darkening Athens streets. Evan gave her a polite tip of his hat as he passed before turning east on 5th. As he did, he noticed her nose deep in the morning's gazette. Gabe Silver and Jason Charles' pictures staring back at him. He didn't like it. East on 5th and over to Merchant, Evan passed the town crier newsstand. Since the Evening Gazette was out, it seemed a good idea to see what dirt on the two murders the police had decided to feed the paper. Nothing he didn't know, it turned out. He paid the man behind the counter and stepped outside. Evan flipped the paper open to read more of the murder's articles when he happened to spy Miss Bacall leaning against a lamppost across the street from him. She was still heavily engrossed in the newspaper. 
Part of Evan's pride wanted to see this as a compliment, that even from afar, his rugged though increasingly tired looks could still capture the imagination of a fair vixen fit for the silver screen. However, his detective's intuition suggested that seeing her a second time was neither her fascination with him nor a straight coincidence. He decided it was a threat until proven otherwise. Evan folded his newspaper, tucked it under his arm, and made his way north up Merchant to 7th, where he stopped in for dinner at Casa Ramos. Yolanda Ramos and the delicious smells of cumin, corn, and beef fat greeted Evan. Yolanda took his coat. The terracotta-colored walls, hung with scenes of pastoral Mexico painted on black velvet, took him out of himself, and he felt his shoulders relax and lower a few inches. Yolanda sat him at his favorite table near the street window. Evan ordered his usual fare and began to read the evening paper. As he moved from page five to six, he noticed the blonde woman in the trench coat admiring something in the shop across the street from Casa Ramos. Her paper was neatly folded under her arm. His pride was still hopeful she was obsessed with the mad attraction that he would have to, with all nobility, refuse, but the detective in him was winning the argument in Evan's head. Besides, he was, he hoped, still on track to win back the heart and devotion of Catherine. He imagined her seated across from him at that moment, the candlelight playing off her green eyes and seeing her face aglow. He sighed and reminded himself that he couldn't mess up this chance with her. Finish this case, tie up all the loose ends, and start a new life with her. Evan turned his head back to where Miss Bacall was. She must have been transfixed by whatever was in that store's window. Evan sucked his teeth. Something about that woman's presence just didn't feel right. The Lauren McCall stand-in stayed at that shop window with her back to Evan for all of dinner. He ate unhurriedly, biding his time. When he finished, Evan paid his bill, passed a generous tip to Yolanda, said something about getting her daughter into a good school when she grew up, got his coat, and walked outside. Evan picked his teeth with a toothpick and dragged his right foot in small arches over the sidewalk, all the while keeping half an eye on Miss Bacall. Not once did she cock her head over her shoulder to see if he had moved on. Evan figured that somehow, even in this fog, she had his reflection in the glass and wouldn't budge until he did. If the number one rule of surveillance is to remain undetected, she was doing a terrible job. If she intended to intimidate him, Evan had to give her decent marks. Evan moved east on 8th Avenue till Sylvan, where he entered the lobby of the Webster Hotel. He wanted to see if he could catch Harold Huber before the night got too long. The activity in the hotel's lobby was light. It was, after all, Friday night. Most residents would either be out on the town or in for the night by that hour. Evan played his odds and strolled comfortably to the front desk. "'May I assist you, sir?' asked the attendant. "'You can,' Evan smiled. "'I'm supposed to meet a friend of mine. He said he was staying here. Can you ring his room?' The attendant smiled back. Certainly, sir. What's the name? Uh, Huber, Evan said, leaning his forearms on the desk. Harold Huber. The attendant ran his finger down the ledger till it stopped at a name. Then he picked up a phone and dialed a room. The attendant smiled tightly at Evan as he waited for the necessary rings to register in his ear. He set the receiver back in the cradle and said, He's not picking up. I see, Evan said and bit his lip. Did he happen to leave his key with you? I couldn't give that to you, the attendant said. No, 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 I'm not asking that, said Evan. I just thought if he were in the shower, he wouldn't pick up and I could wait. If he were already out, then I would know where to go, you see? The attendant smiled and turned to see if his guest had dropped off his key. While he looked, Evan scanned the lobby. Sure enough, across the floor, seated in a mauve velvet armchair next to a well-watered fern, sat Miss Bacall. Only now, she had ditched the morning's paper in preference for the evening one. Here it is, the attendant said, snapping Evan's attention back around. I guess Mr. Huber has already stepped out. Thanks, Evan said. Is there anything else I can help you with, the man asked. Evan paused, then, yeah, act casual, but you see that woman over there by the fern? Evan asked without turning around. The attendant lifted his eyes for a moment and then dropped them back down to Evan. He nodded. Ever seen her before? The attendant shook his head. Looks familiar, though, he said. Yes, she does, Evan said. Just one of those faces, the man said. That's probably it, Evan said and patted the counter. Thanks for the info, buddy. Evan strolled back out of the lobby and passed Lauren. He stood out on the sidewalk and didn't know where to go next. Evan remembered the theater ticket from his search of Harold's pockets and checked his watch. After doing some quick calculation, Evan figured he might be able to catch Harold at the intermission if he hurried. He hustled a quarter mile west and north to the Granada Playhouse. 
Several men and women dressed very fine stood outside, presumably to get some fresh air before seeing the conclusion of the play. Evan spied Harold and walked up to him. Is the show any good? Evan remarked. Several emotions flashed across Harold's face in quick succession. First, surprise, followed by confusion, panic, irritation, and resolution. Ah, yes, he said. You noticed the ticket in my wallet, Harold sighed. How may I help you, Mr. Gold? Yeah, Evan said. I had a question for you. If it's about our business deal, I must insist that we talk about it during daylight hours. Evan shook his head. Sure thing. You see that woman back there? Evan stood shoulder to shoulder with Harold. What woman? Harold asked. She's about half a block down, trench coat, hair practically glows in the streetlights. Evan stared her down from a distance. Then he placed his hand around Harold's shoulder and pointed directly at her. There she is. Yes, Harold said, removing Evan's arm. Is she a friend of yours? Can't say she is, Evan said. To be honest, I was wondering the same thing about you. That what? Did I know her? Harold asked. No, I've never seen her before. Then he said, would you like me to introduce you? No, said Evan, turning to face Harold again. I can make my own introductions. No, she's been following me all evening. Perhaps she finds you enchanting, Harold said. You're too kind. That's what I thought at first, but I don't think that's it. Something in my gut. Something I can't put my finger on, Evan said. You wouldn't happen to know why she's following me. Harold shrugged. How could I possibly know that? Yeah, Evan said and bit his lip. It couldn't be somebody else looking for this pearl. Maybe the person who tossed my office, or maybe she works with the person who... You see what I'm driving at? Believe me, Mr. Gold, I find all of this mildly interesting, said Harold Huber, but the second act is about to start. All I can say is that if she is after the item in question, you are reckless to link the two of us together. Not quite the behavior I would expect from a professional detective. I don't know, Evan said. Maybe it was reckless. Then again, maybe it wasn't. Regardless, Mr. Gold, I can tell you I've never seen the woman before and cannot tell you why or if she has been following you. My suggestion, since it is the weekend and you seem to have some time on your hands, go to her, take her out for a coffee, chat, make eyes at each other, but please leave me out of it. Harold turned his head back to the theater when Evan grabbed his arm. I understand you don't know her, Harold, but you should know I don't play favorites. She gets in the way and there's a good chance she gets hurt. Caught in the crossfire, so to speak. Harold turned and looked coolly at Evan. What you do is your business, Mr. Gold. Good night. Harold jerked his arm out of Evan's grasp, gave a curt nod in Evan's direction, spun on his heels, and re-entered the Granada's lobby. Evan looked back at where the young woman had been standing. She was still there. Evan put his hands in his pockets and immediately his fingers found the pearl. His mind was filled with the same visions of the woman following him that he'd had earlier that day. Only now her features were more evident. Miss Bacall. He chuckled to himself with relief that these visions and reality might square up. <laughs> Thanks, he muttered to whoever this pearl was that was helping him. Took in a deep breath of foggy air and began again his circuitous walking methods to lose Miss Bacall. After 15 minutes of moving south from street to alley to back door to kitchen to road and many points of interest in between, Evan Gold accomplished two objectives simultaneously. He looked around and the platinum blonde was nowhere to be seen. The added benefit was that he stood at the front door of the Walnut Grove Apartments. Evan pressed the button marked Wolf five times. A moment later, he heard the buzz and the door unlock. He opened the front door and walked in. So there are a lot of Easter eggy type things going on in this chapter that uh, I had completely forgotten about until I was re-listening uh, to this. I think one of them that isn't an Easter egg is the existence of a restaurant named Casa Ramos. That exists, and it is on the main uh, drag in Emporia, Kansas, which is the stand-in for Athens, Kansas. Uh, and this, well, I guess, I don't know how you say that. Athens, Kansas is in this book, but it is based on Emporia, Kansas, which is my hometown. And Well, I guess there are two main drags, really, in Emporia. One is 6th six, Street, which is the old Highway 50, U.S. Highway 50. And then there is Commercial, which runs uh, perpendicular to 6th Street. 
Sixth is a hard word to say, I'm realizing. Uh, but commercial um, sort of stops at uh, the university, Emporia State University, and then heads south all the way you know, past the train tracks, which I, I think we do have, or at least had that kind of thing where the, um, you know, the people on the other side of the tracks. But down on the south end, which is sort of where Evan lives, that's down there where all the murders took place in this book, and all that's on the, on the south side of Emporia. Is it south? It's south in my head. Someone's going to tell me it's not south, that it's a different direction. I'm, Emporia is shaped like a football, and I can't remember which direction things are. I'm terribly directionally challenged. But down by Soden's Grove and all that stuff, that's where the murders happen, which is opposite the town from the university. Anyway, I was looking on Street View trying to find places that um, – Evan could frequent or go to or whatever. And I haven't been to Emporia really. I think I drove through it a couple years ago, but I haven't been there to live and kind of know the layout since high school. So it's been a while. And I was on Street View on Google and about where um, I think we already ran into one restaurant like this. Um, but there's another restaurant that's currently alive and well in, in Emporia named Casa Ramos. And so if you are in the Emporia area, I cannot recommend their food, but I can't not recommend their food for I've never eaten there. But, you know, it's a place. And I have no idea if anybody named Yolanda works there or not or what her kids are doing for college. But. Um, you can at least go uh, check that out. Um, other things that I, th- I think are kind of fun, uh, the Granada Theater is also a real thing. Uh, there is an old, 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 old movie theater that has been refurbished over the years called the Granada Theater. And when I was a child, it was not yet condemned. And in the summers, I think I went to go see summer movies there. There was some program that the public school system had where you could buy these vouchers and then send your kid. We wandered from our house, me and my brother, we would walk from our house downtown to this theater. Now, I don't know, it was like a for a fourth and fifth grader kind of thing. It was you know like a good half hour walk to get there without parents. These are things that I would never do with my children. Um, but we would walk downtown to this really cruddy theater. Uh, it was huge. I just think old 1920s, 1930s movie theater. All of the architecture, It's. I'm sure it was beautiful in its day, but by 1980, whatever, it looks terrible. And I think every movie I saw there, the film broke. Uh, it was just, it was always a mess, but it was things like the black hole and, uh, bed knobs and broomsticks or Cinderella or all, all, I met, this may have been where I saw Star Wars for the first time. I have no idea back in 1970, whatever it was. Um, and, um, it got condemned. It was so bad off and, I think somebody put some money into it. It was a historical building. It was on the National Registry, so it couldn't get torn down. And it really is a beautiful building. And I believe either the university or the arts groups um, in town, they've refurbished it. And I don't think it's a movie theater anymore. I think it's a live uh, performance hall with a real stage, and you can get on and perform. I haven't been in there. It'd be great to uh, swing by there sometime next time I'm visiting friends in Kansas City, drive up in there and uh, check out the, the Granada Theater. Or, if again, if you're in the Emporia area and would like to check out a nice historical uh, artifact, the Granada Theater is right there on commercial as well. Um but uh, again, I think uh, last week I was talking about the the show uh, that Harold has tickets to called Yukon Melody. Uh, this whole thing of coming outside in the intermission and getting a breath of fresh air, there's kind of a couple things that that makes me remember. One is in the summers in Emporia, the university has a summer theater program. I got to be a part of it. My dad was a part of it. Um, I loved it. As a kid, I loved it. As an actor in it, I loved, I just loved it. Um, and how it would go is you have eight weeks of uh, a summer. You have four plays that you're doing in eight weeks, and you're in rehearsals for like 10 hours a day for, I can't remember if it was six days a week or five days a week, but you're just in a lot of rehearsals. And sort of once you got one show up on stage in front of an audience the next day, maybe you get a day off, but then you start rehearsing the next show. So at some point, 
you're performing a play and rehearsing a different one during the day. So it's kind of this weird mind thing going on. But it was a ton of fun. And what what happened, um, there's an intermission. Usually in a live play between acts, there's an intermission. And a lot of people would hang out in the lobby, as you do. Some people would hang out, I guess, in the theater. But then some people would hang outside in the nice summer Kansas air and get a breath of fresh air. This would not happen at the Granada for, again, it was condemned. Um, but this did happen at Bruder Theater at the e, uh, East State campus. And this is just sort of uh, one of those things that uh, was kind of cobbling together this memory of you get outside and you kind of breathe the air and all this kind of stuff. I personally think it's funny that in a lot of cases people went out to get a breath of fresh air and that translated into they needed to smoke a cigarette, which I don't necessarily think that is fresh air, but that's what they were doing. Um, But then uh, this uh, other character, this Lauren Bacall, um, she is just the costuming, the whole thing. She's just ripped right out of uh, some kind of really campy crime noir pulp fiction kind of uh, book. And um, she's she's going to be she's going to turn into a very, I think, interesting character as we go through the story. But I, I wanted to have uh, I've, I've realized that. Um, Evan is surrounded by really mysterious women. He's got his wife, Catherine, and what is she going to do? We have Claire, who's clearly not on the level, um, but we don't know all that she knows or isn't telling. And now we've got this uh, lady who's just like a ghost wandering around following Evan in all these places. So he's just surrounded uh, by uh, an interesting uh, cast of characters right now. Um, but this is set in 1962. And uh, we've, in a previous chapter, established that Marilyn Monroe is already dead. So I couldn't have her be a knockoff of uh, Marilyn. And because it is a crime noir, it made sense to... Well, let's talk about Lauren Bacall, who was married to Humphrey Bogart, who was in several movies that were in this kind of genre. And, um, you know, the whole thing with the, there's, there's people who look like you out there. There's doppelgangers out there um, that what would a low rent uh Lauren Bacall look like and behave like and all this kind of stuff. So she's a, she's a fun character. We're going to run into her uh, more throughout the, the book and see sort of uh, who she is and, and what becomes of all that. Um, but the thing that I realized as I was uh, listening to this again, uh, of like, man, if I could have another stab at this chapter, I would at least fix this bit where I don't know it's clear from when I'm listening to it. So I want to make sure it's obvious to you. Um, in a previous chapter, as Evan is walking down the street, he's holding on to the pearl in his pocket and it gives him a vision that there is someone following him. And uh, he doesn't turn around to see if what the pearl is showing him is real or not. He just senses that it is, so he acts as if it is true. And what he now knows is that as he grabs the pearl in this chapter, that there's more information that come in, comes in the vision, and he sees now the, the person that he saw in the vision earlier in a previous chapter is now... He now realizes it's this um, Lauren Bacall person. Um, so I don't know. Maybe that didn't make it any more any more sense at all. But I know that when I listened to the chapter, it didn't. So there you go. Things I would change if I had that opportunity. Uh, last week, I mentioned that I uh, have put out a doodle prompt book. If you like um, doodling um, but don't often know what to doodle, um, I've put out a book that you can go uh, check out. Uh, I've put the the link in the show notes, but I've written it as a pseudonym so that all of the the fiction that I write is under my name, Brian Thomas Crop. And then um, I'm working on some uh, quarterly planner journals. I've got this uh, doodle prompt book. There may be some others like this, some other books that I would like also to put out. Um, but I'm using a pseudonym for it, uh, for those, and that pseudonym is Paul Christopher. And I said, well, maybe I would tell you where that comes from because, and this is only like three people in the whole wide world will care about this, but uh, prior to me being born, my name was going to be Paul Christopher Crop. 
And then there was this man who played for, I believe it was the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think it was football. Um, his name was Brian Piccolo and he got cancer and he died and that was sad. And they made a movie, uh, called Brian's song about him and his friendship with another teammate. And it was a very popular movie. I think there was a popular theme song. And if you look at the records of about the time I was born, which is early 70s, there are a lot of Bryans that came out, uh, were named as babies around that time. I don't know if it was all because of Brian's song. I only know that I was named Brian because my mom saw Brian's song or she liked the song Brian's song or something. And that's how I got my name. And I believe Thomas came from one of the actors on the Waltons, if I'm remembering correctly. Mom, if you're listening, you can correct me on that. But that that's my understanding. I was going to be Paul Christopher, but I ended up as Brian Thomas. So there you go. This is how people get named. Um, but if you would like to check out the uh, prompt book, you can uh, do that. You can search 500 doodling prompts, Paul Christopher at Amazon, or you can look at the link. You can go to Shell Game in Amazon uh, and uh, check that out as well. Uh, you can go to my uh, website at brianthomascrop.com and you can find uh, Shell Game for nothing. You can just read it. You don't have to buy it. You can just read it over there. You can stay with this show and listen to it chapter by chapter. That would also be fun. Um, either way, uh, if you have not yet hopped on to my reader group, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, you can do that uh, again at BrianThomasCrop.com, and it is there that uh, you get uh, sort of the inside track on new releases and what's going on in uh, my life and uh, how you can be a part of that. Uh, I, for just the mere exchange of an email address, I will also send you um, a bunch of, of the stories that I have um, written. A lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them have been a part of this show. It's about a 200-page uh, PDF, and would love to send that to you as well, um, and uh, we can get to know each other just a little bit better. So check that out at BrianThomasCrop.com. Between now and the next time we get together, I hope you have a tremendous week. Thank you so much for uh, being a part of this show today.